so what I'm going to uh, try to do today is to uh, give you an update on uh, what we've been doing over the last uh, 10 plus years as far as investigating the benefits and safety of medications in the treatment of ASD and really try to emphasize first what's rock solid and then move on. Um, and that second part uh, is more, um, I think, what many of you may have come here for, which is to hear uh, specifically about what, what's next. Uh, what do we think is on the horizon? What are we doing um, here at UCLA um, behind, uh, behind those uh, uh, walls with our research? But uh, first of all, it, it uh, goes without saying that medication treatment in ASD really is an adjunctive approach, at least um, as of 2014. Um, it's something to be added to a bedrock of treatment as what we heard about just now from Dr. Galsrud, um, behavioral, social, educational interventions that really are the, the crux at this point of what makes the most difference um, in ASD. But, um, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, Thomas Insel, has published a paper uh, to all of the researchers in uh, ASD and mental health, and he's demanding, pounding the table for curative therapeutics with medications. None of this um, a little, little bit of benefit. Um, he wants us to set our sights high, and indeed, um, we're, we're listening to him, um, he funds our research, and I'll give you a glimpse of uh, what we're trying to do in response uh, to his uh, call, uh, call to arms. These represent my disclosures and involvement in uh, clinical treatment research. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna uh, focus first on what uh, you all should know um, has rock solid evidence, what kinds of behaviors we do know that we uh, have something to offer for with these medication treatments, and, uh, a little bit about how to use them, and then focus on uh, what, what's next. So why do um, parents and family members bring their loved ones to see us um, in, uh, or as physicians in, in relationship to drug treatment? More often than not, it's, uh, it's one of these uh, bubbles here, um, either profound sleep disturbance, aggressive behavior, hyperactive, inattentive behaviors, uh, even self-injurious behaviors, and sometimes uh, pronounced problems with mood and anxiety. Now, um, again, it, it should be said that um, many behavioral treatments focus on uh, these severe and challenging uh, behaviors and uh, should be looked to, uh, uh, to, to attempt to, to handle them. But uh, unfortunately, we, we all know um, all too often that uh, sometimes these treatments do fall short and hence the need to consider other medication or other treatments like medications. And indeed, if you go out into the community and ask just how common the use of medications are in the treatment of uh, children and adults with ASD. Simply, it's widespread. Um, this is a survey from the Autism Treatment Network that looked at nearly 3,000 individuals uh, treated in their um, multi-site uh, network. And you see that uh, if you go up uh, increasingly year by year in this sample, some um, Almost two-thirds of these individuals were receiving medication. In other surveys, that figure is as high as 70 or 80 percent. What does that mean? Well, first of all, um, our available non-medical treatments do sometimes fall short. And secondly, that uh, parents and uh, practitioners believe these things have something to offer. Now. Um, uh, one of the uh, sub-themes of my talk is that not all treatments that are prescribed with regularity in the community have a, a solid evidence base, and that should um, lead us to be a bit more conservative, perhaps, than um, at times we behave. But 
We have been uh, busily working away on some of these uh, very challenging behaviors, and we've accomplished a lot. Let's start with the first um, target, if you will, because we, we tend to think of these medications not as, at least at this point, treating autism as a whole, but rather specific targeted components or behaviors. Um, and irritability is a common one. Some have suggested that as many as 40% uh, of individuals with ASD at some point in their life will manifest pretty severe uh, symptoms in this broad uh, dimension. And at least how it's been defined in these medication studies consists of sort of a gamish, if you will, of uh, the following. Things like self-injurious behavior, aggression, uh, mood um, instability and severe mood states, tantruming, and loud dysregulated behavior. You may wonder, gee, those, are, are those really all the same? Um, that's a good question, but um, it, at least in the way in which we've approached uh, testing particular medications thus far, this is the, the construct that we've applied. So one of the successes um, was an FDA approval for medication, risperidone, for the treatment of this irritability. Not just a little irritability, not just little tantrums, but a, a very severe levels of irritability. These are kids who were right on the cusp of either getting hospitalized, kicked out of their classroom, or placed out of their home. Um, and what we did in this uh, relatively straightforward study uh, here at UCLA and at uh, four other sites around the country was um, using standard methodology, randomize, flip a coin, assign half to a rather low dose risperidone, which has the brand name Risperdal, um, or placebo, and uh, monitor them regularly for eight weeks. And even with a very low dose of this medication, less than two milligrams per day in this uh, group of kids who were aged uh, five to 17, uh, average about nine or 10, uh, we saw a greater than 60% drop in this irritability rating as measured by uh, parents and confirmed by other observers as well, compared to about a 15% drop in the placebo group. In uh, the, the psychiatric drug uh, research world, this is a whopping change, a whopping treatment difference. And uh, uh, the FDA thought so too, and with acceptable safety, they approved it for this very special or targeted use, irritability associated with autism in children and adolescents. Um, now we all know that, uh, uh, as one of my friends says, um, no medication works if it doesn't have side effects. Um, and uh, certainly ris risperidone falls into that category. Um, as you can see here, the group of kids receiving risperidone in the first eight weeks had a lot more of a variety of side effects, things like appetite increase, drowsiness and fatigue, dizziness, and even some um, early signs of what is uh, referred to as extrapyramidal symptoms, um, drooling um, and tremor. Fortunately, though, um, dropout was very low. So most kids, um, especially with this rather low dose applied, were able to stick with the medication. In fact, um, tolerated it well and did well as a result. But uh, the longer term side effects of, of this medication remain a concern. It uh, works very well um, for a short or inter intermediate length um, intervention, six months maybe a year, but it's the kind of treatment that should be continually re-examined, re-evaluated with the question of, is this really necessary? Well, using almost identical methods, the field kind of moved on and tested other similar medications, again, for this irritability target. And lo and behold, uh, another medicine proved that it was up to the challenge. This time, uh, aripiprazole, very different in the mechanism that it has compared to risperidone, which in itself is kind of interesting. Um, but it also showed that uh, in general, 
uh, when compared to placebo, uh, children uh, receiving it for an eight-week period showed uh, much larger reductions in irritability uh, compared to the placebo group. And the overall uh, responder rate uh, was about uh, twice that in the placebo group. Now, aripiprazole is kind of interesting, um, and it did get an FDA approval. So th those form the only two medications currently FDA approved uh, for the treatment of autism plus anything, um, irritability in both of these cases. But aripiprazole, um, especially for clinicians and, and uh, parents, uh, proved to have a very different dose response profile. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, with risperidone, uh, to some extent, and certainly clinical experience uh, bears this out as well, that the higher the dose, usually the more potent, the stronger the effect, um, and sometimes the side effects too. But with aripiprazole, um, perhaps as you can see here with the um, global uh, improvement rates um, in this particular third bar, um, hover, eat, all hovering around 50%, we saw no difference between kids on the low dose, five milligrams a day, versus those with 10 and 15 milligrams per day. Suggesting that uh, there's maybe even more individual differences in the way that children with ASD respond to this medication. And there's a risk that clinicians could overshoot, perhaps, or maybe undershoot, and, and suggesting a, a need for an even more careful examination of dose and uh, benefit. Uh, aripiprazole also uh, was uh, associated with side effects, although with a somewhat different profile, not quite as much appetite increase, although uh, these kids did gain more uh, weight than those on placebo during the, the eight weeks. About half that is that we saw in the risperidone study. But other side effects um, uh, were, were also seen tremor and uh, particular kinds of um, motor and neurologic side effects, such as restlessness and uh, muscle uh, spasm. So like uh, risperidone, this is a medicine that can yield a, a huge short-term benefit. Um, at least that's what the, the studies have examined, and that's about as much as we can say. Um, with respect to aripiprazole, they did, to their credit, continue um, a second study that followed kids for a whole year on the treatment. A lot of kids dropped out during that time period, suggesting that either they didn't need the medicine as much anymore, or maybe they didn't like uh, the benefits or the effects that they saw. But um, at the end of the 52-week study, they still, still saw large decreases compared to study entry in this irritability, tantruming, aggression um, uh, dimension. Now, I'll mention one other thing that we learned, though, from both the aripiprazole and the risperidone studies, and it remains a challenge to us to this day. Uh, embedded in that irritability dimension, there were like, like 15 different symptoms, were three on self-injurious behavior. Neither medication reduced self-injury compared to placebo. Big disappointment, because as many of you know, self-injury can be a very, very problematic behavior to address, even with the best, uh, with the world-class behaviorist uh, at your side. So um, in child psychiatry, we love thinking about report cards. Um, and our report card in this area, treatment of irritability in ASD, probably a solid B average. We've got, we've got some A's, but there's a lot we don't know. Most of these other medications have uh, the, a very, very small amount of information and investigation associated with them. They, they might work. Um, there's been a small controlled trial of valproic acid. This is a different medication. Um, an anticonvulsant, small uh, but st statistically significant decreases in irritability in that study, but not anything I'm going to brag about at the cocktail party, honestly. Uh, likewise, olanzapine, which is another powerful antipsychotic, uh, 
uh, has been shown to have some uh, benefits, but these appeared to fall a little bit more intermediate to those two approved treatments through risperidone and, and aripiprazole. Now there's some uh, uh, clinical observation studies and uncontrolled trials suggesting that some antidepressants might actually impact on irritability, and you could kind of understand why that might be true since mood um, symptoms make up a considerable part of this irritability dimension. But again, there's no controlled trial that uh, nails that uh, to be sure. And then alpha agonists like uh, clonidine or guanfacine uh, have also been observed to have some benefits, but uh, still we're awaiting the, the more scientific, the rigorous kind of test. So some progress there, good news. Let's move on to another very, very common um, set of challenging behaviors in ASD. And this, this is across the whole um, ability spectrum, whether you're uh, super bright or whether you're more challenged with ASD. And that is um, ADHD-like symptoms, trouble sticking with things, um, poor concentration, impulsive behavior, hyperactivity, uh, things like running away, um, needing, um, needing a one-on-one -on -one shadow to stay in your seat for even half of a classroom session and to apply oneself to completing um, even a modest amount of academic work. Some people have said that uh, we maybe should consider ADHD symptoms as a part of the ASD um, syndrome itself because it, it's so darn common. In uh, clinics like ours, for example, probably two, uh, three quarters of the kids we see have lots and lots of these symptoms. In larger population studies, though, if you just go out and, and uh, don't identify people from their need for treatment, uh, it's still a very, very common accompanying feature. Uh, probably at least a third, maybe even higher, have um, significant behavioral uh, difficulties in this domain. So what can we do? Well, a couple of years ago, again, we took the simple man's approach to um, uh, trying to address these, these symptoms when they haven't responded to, to good uh, behavioral interventions or classroom um, manipulations. We asked the question, do, do the same treatments that seem to help typical kids with ADHD help kids on the spectrum with these uh, similar looking uh, symptoms? The answer was a, a, a qualified yes. Now the clinical lore up until that time was, oh, steer clear of the stimulants in ASD, very bad. Um, that was based on some uh, descriptions of very pronounced side effects and uh, some questions about whether or not uh, the benefits were really there. But what we showed in this study um, with a randomized design and a placebo, um, again, fairly tightly controlled, is that half of the kids had a good response. Yay, um, this medicine has something to offer. Um, but uh, that in itself uh, is important to highlight because if we were comparing this to a pie chart of a typically developing group of kids with ADHD, this slice would be more like 75%. So it's not quite as um, uh, frequently effective in ASD. But if it can help half of all kids with these types of symptoms, I think that's important to keep in mind. Many clinicians still avoid uh, these medications uh, due to um, these concerns. Now, the other thing we found, though, in this particular slice, uh, it, it demonstrates that nearly one out of five kids couldn't take this medication, even for just a very uh, brief exposure of five weeks. And that's almost 10 times, at least five times, what you see in uh, studies of kids with ADHD without ASD. So the clinicians were also partly right with respect to uh, the sensitivity to stimulant side effects in ASD. It is true that you're going to run into more uh, youngsters who cannot uh, take this medicine, even in the, the low to medium doses that we used. That's another important uh, clinical caveat, that the dose ranges that we used um, 
were uh, probably uh, overall about two-thirds lower than uh, what's usually applied in typically developing kids. So start lower, don't go as high, and be very careful. But something to offer. What about other treatments? Uh, you all may be very familiar with a variety of other medications that are uh, not stimulants that uh, are approved for ADHD in typically developing kids, such as atomoxetine. Um, the brand name is Stratera. Um, that's been tested now in uh, more than two placebo-controlled trials. Again, the answer back that we've gotten is a qualified yes. Uh, this seems to, to offer some benefit. This is from a European study, relatively large one, um, in which clearly atomoxetine was associated with a greater decrease in ADHD symptoms than placebo. And uh, the response rates were um, uh, slightly higher, uh, numerically higher, about two, twofold or so in the atomoxetine group, but falling, falling short of the levels we would hope for. Now, I'm afraid that our European colleagues probably underdosed they used um, a me mean dose of 1.2 milligrams per kilogram per day. And in a lot of the atomoxetine studies, um, you'll find that the, the mean daily dose really needed to be more like 1.4, and in some individuals, even, even higher than that. Clinically, we sometimes push it to 1.8 or even approaching two milligrams per kilogram per day. So they may have undershot, but um, nevertheless, it suggests a modest benefit. And there's an, another smaller US trial that comes to pretty much the same conclusion. There's been some um, initial efforts to sort of lump all of this data together and ask uh, how, how do things line up? How do, how do the, the um, available data inform us regarding uh, these different different drugs. Certainly the stimulants are viewed to be effective at this point. There's been some other studies that have come out confirming its benefits. Uh, but almost all of them find a, a somewhat reduced total benefit compared to uh, what you see in typically developing youngsters. One of the things that we've observed in our ADHD studies recently, which I think is relevant here, is that while guanfacine one of the, uh, the other treatments for these um, types of symptoms can be uh, quite beneficial for uh, reducing ADHD symptoms. It lacks the cognitive boost that the stimulants seem to display. A fairly uh, significant um, uh, difference and, and um, a disappointment. And uh, we're just, we've just finished a study in kids with ASD with high levels of these ADHD behaviors uh, don't have the answer back from that yet, but we've also looked at cognitive functioning in that study too, so we'll be able to, to really confirm whether or not uh, we see the same kind of phenomenon. Behavioral benefit, but no boost to actual learning or focus. And then the third target where we've made some um, solid advances, and we have some good evidence to support uh, actual treatment recommendations, is in the area of sleep. Um, no question that uh, sleep complaints, insomnia, uh, sometimes severe lifelong sleep disruptions are more common in individuals with ASD. Um, awakenings, um, difficulty uh, with delayed um, bedtimes, just about every kind of sleep problem you can imagine seems to be um, more frequent in this population. But, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the use of melatonin for sleep. And uh, the bottom line is that um, um, multiple placebo-controlled studies line up with the same conclusion. Fairly effective and appears fairly safe. Um, although the doses used um, sometimes um, are a little higher in these studies than what um, many parents seem to utilize, uh, leading to the possibility that they may erroneous, erroneously uh, believe that um, the medicine is, is of no value. Now, it's not, like these, uh, it's not like melatonin knocks you out for hours and hours, um, it, but it, it does um, achieve a, f a fairly clinically significant result, I think, 
what you can see here is the amount of um, uh, change in the onset of, of sleep um, coming about an hour earlier than the baseline or about 40 uh, plus minutes compared to the placebo group. And the actual duration of sleep also increased about an hour, um, 45 minutes to an hour. That's significant. That's um, not a bad uh, result, um, especially given just individual differences um, in response. So a lot of kids are, are actually getting a great deal of benefit. And these studies averaged about six milligrams um, of melatonin per day, and some went up as high as 10 to 12 milligrams uh, per day. The other feature of melatonin that um, most of you probably know is that uh, in normal physiology, the melatonin surge um, begins about an hour and a half or two hours before um, the onset of sleep. So that uh, is a very useful guide in terms of when parents should administer the medicine. It should be roughly at least an hour and a half before desired bedtime. There's kind of that, uh, more of a lag than some parents appreciate. Okay, so um, those are all important targets. We can help um, kids and, and adults um, with these types of behaviors with those treatments, but like our NIMH director told us, um, we've got to aim higher than that. Uh, there's, there's more to do, and we heard that with even the best um, social and behavioral treatments, we're not, um, we're not helping too many um, kids um, come off their diagnosis, so to speak. Um, there is a great deal of social disability that remains despite our best efforts and years and years and years of intervention. So what would our hope for targets be? They would be enhancing social interaction, decreasing problematic repetitive behavior and communication, aiming for the core of ASD. What about repetitive behaviors and, and uh, these more kind of central targets, the core? Are we crazy to think that a medication might um, have any impact on these features? I mean, this is, this is what autism is made up of uh, as we understand it, right? Um, well, let's look at one study and, and see. Um, no question repetitive behaviors can be severely impairing um, and, and they can block even the best uh, uh, teacher or behaviorist from engaging the child and moving them forward. So a treatment that could bring that down um, could uh, open up a child's uh, availability for other types of interventions. So going back to that first risperidone study um, that I showed you, uh, a few years later we uh, drilled back down in the data and looked at the other types of symptoms that we measured pre and post um, medication or placebo. And we asked the question, what else seemed to change with the medication treatment more than in the placebo? And uh, th this is a, a score of repetitive behavior more uh, kind of obsessive compulsive like behaviors that clinicians um, who didn't know the treatment group of the kids measured. This is the change on placebo, not much. And this is the change in kids in the risperidone group for the first eight weeks. This difference was um, statistically significant. I think the effect size was something like 0.4 or so, but it went away when we um, corrected for lots and, and lots of comparisons, lots of statistical tests um, to be conservative. Uh, but uh, this, this is about a 35% difference um, between the two groups. And I don't know, so you might look, look at this and say, well, McCracken, um, yeah, I'm seeing maybe a, a three-point difference. I'm not that impressed. And I, I think you're probably right that um, if we're really looking for a treatment in this domain, um, it's got to be bigger, it's got to do more. But um, we were uh, heartened by seeing this difference because when we followed these kids four more months later, the ones who did best on the medication were offered four more months of treatment, um, the repetitive behavior score stayed uh, flat. It seemed like um, this was a durable effect. You know, if, if you saw that creeping back up again, you, you might think, uh, well, it's just kind of a 
associated a halo effect of their behavior getting better, but I think this, this at least raises the question uh, that, yes, um, maybe medications um, might uh, have benefit in this domain if we could just get it right, choose the, um, the, the right ones. A lot of people have been attempting to, to show that medications help repetitive behaviors. Using that OCD kind of um, analog model, thinking that repetitive behaviors might be like obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which now I think has been kind of uh, discarded. But initially, just looking at fluoxetine or Prozac, uh, you see here not much change in those that got placebo for eight weeks, but those who got the fluoxetine had a little drop. And then when you cross them over, those that then got the active medicine, the fluoxetine, showed a similar drop, and those on placebo um, showed no change. But again, I think the clinical significance uh, challenge is, is uh, appropriate here too. Not much of an effect, and in larger studies, this just wasn't borne out, like this one that we did um, for NIMH. We compared a, another SSRI to placebo, and this is the worst uh, result of any work that I've ever been involved in. <laughs> but we've, we're not going to stop here. Um, now, as you know, there's been a lot of interest in oxytocin, uh, the love hormone, um, and for good reason. Um, it's a fascinating observation that uh, a hormone can affect um, the behavior and, and uh, social understanding, even in um, controls in healthy individuals. That seems like a fact. Uh, but people have, have kind of made a big leap to uh, thinking that perhaps oxytocin may be uh, the curative therapeutic for autism. Um, now there was an early study uh, now uh, some 10 years ago that gave a single IV dose of oxytocin and compared that to salt water and actually found some reductions in repetitive behaviors in a, like a three hour period. Um, but if you line up the data, our, our understanding of uh, actually what we believe causes autism, there's not a lot that would suggest that autism is an oxytocin deficient disorder. Um, we wish there was maybe more evidence uh, that it was, but uh, it's just not there right now. In fact, adults with autism have been found to have elevated oxytocin levels in their bloodstream. Uh, but nevertheless, um, there's lots of interest in this approach because it's a natural hormone, right? Um, what, it sounds like a, a potentially um, excellent solution. So this is from the, the most recent study that includes twice daily administration of oxytocin over a six week period. And this is done by the people who truly believe this works. So what did they find? Unfortunately, um, nothing of significance. Um, now they looked at things like, um, these are a global measure of repetitive and restrictive behaviors. And you see here baseline to placebo, uh, uh, baseline to end of trial, baseline to end of trial. No difference. You don't need a fancy German trained statistician to tell you that. Um, and even when they tried to carve out their own uh, subgroup of repetitive behaviors, the behaviors that they thought would change the most, that were most OCD-like, they really didn't see, they didn't see a significant change. You might consider this to be a trend. And there was a trend for a somewhat greater improvement but I think we have to say that this is a negative study. Um, it doesn't really support um, uh, uh, the use of oxytocin. Nevertheless, well, I, I can't say that we know everything we need to know about it. Um, maybe we're looking at the wrong set of behaviors, right? Um, we just don't know. Um, and indeed, the National Institute of Health has funded a, a major oxytocin, oxytocin study that um, is to, uh, to start relatively soon uh, that I think will be a much more definitive um, test of its benefit. Um, a number of other treatments have been um, explored. You may have heard things like memantine, 
a drug that was developed and used for the treatment of dementia. Um, it also has a large uh, ongoing trial underway. Um, it's unique in that it blocks um, the signaling of a major neurotransmitter called glutamate, very important in processes such as learning, memory, and also in excess. It um, has uh, 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 neurotoxic effects, um, may be related to seizures in some children. So there, there are many reasons to uh, be interested in, in this type of mechanism, but we just don't yet know if that works, nor if it's safe. Um, there's also been a recent trial of a similar medicine called Rile Riluzol, um, uh, as well for repetitive behaviors in ASD, and unfortunately that didn't look so good, um, although uh, more study is needed. There's some interest in a different kind of hormone manipulation, uh, actually blocking a, a hormone called arginine vasopressin, which um, kind of works counter to oxytocin, you, you might think of it. Um, and there's some drugs that are pretty selective at blocking vasopressin. There's some uh, data both uh, from anim animal models and animal studies and uh, a sparse amount of clinical data suggesting that um, arginine vasopressin might be elevated or might be associated with some of the behavioral abnormalities um, that um, are common in ASD. And we're involved in a study of this treatment in adults uh, currently. But uh, suffice it to say, we've got a long uh, ways to go with identifying treatments for the repetitive behaviors. Um, but we do have some promising uh, targets and promising compounds to explore. Next target, anxiety. I think um, everyone who um, knows um, much about ASD appreciates that anxiety is a, a hugely common feature. Um, again, estimates suggest that uh, depending on how you assess it, uh, you may see elevated levels of anxiety in the majority of people on the spectrum, although there, there's some controversy, as you might imagine, about how to assess this, how to measure it, um, and especially in the most uh, communication-challenged individuals. Um, suffice it to say, it's, and it's surprising, um, but there's no data, there's no um, uh, actual studies of the use of medications for the treatment of anxiety and ASD. It's a huge uh, gap in our, our knowledge base, and yet, uh, the, the problem is in our face every day in clinical practice. So much more to do. Um, so let's move on to the next target. Again, listening to that director of NIMH um, uh, whipping us to think about how to uh, develop curative uh, treatments. For ASD, that's got to involve improving social functioning, right? Um, it's a core deficit to be sure, but if you start thinking about um, how to measure it or what it even consists of, immediately you, become, you come to appreciate this is complicated. It's not uh, some kind of unitary set of behaviors, but it includes things like the apparent lack of social interest, sometimes amazing um, uh, disinterest in, um, in others that individuals with ASD can show. Um, but it obviously also includes communication. We saw examples of that on the video. Um, uh, Nonverbal behaviors uh, being so different and responding so much to treatment, clearly it, hugely important. And then there's probably something else about just the experience of individuals with ASD uh, with other people and how rewarding it feels to them and how enduring that um, interaction or experience can be. Uh, almost like um, both the pleasure that may come with it but also the memory of it and, and uh, that embedded experience. It's not exactly the same as the interest and it's certainly not the same as the communication skill. And then there's even the social understanding part, the ability to figure out what other people are feeling or suggesting by their 
uh, by the winks of their eye or the, the uh, subtle differences in their facial expression. So to test a medication for changes in social behavior, social communication, becomes kind of complicated and you really have to figure out what you're aiming for. Is this even possible? Well, again, we went back to some of the, the old studies that we'd done. I'm going to finish here in just a minute, I promise. Um, we went back to the two risperidone studies that we did, and um, we looked at this other scale that um, we collected in these two studies that is referred to as um, social withdrawal. It's made up of about, um, I think, 16 questions that include things like, responds to um, when spoken to, or uh, prefers to be alone, um, uh, shows interest in, in others, uh, things like that. Um, and the scores are high in individuals with ASD, as you might imagine. We actually showed that compared to the one placebo group that we had, that the risperidone actually knocked down the social withdrawal scores in uh, three separate groups. The, the first randomized group to risperidone, the kids who had placebo first and then uh, were given the drug openly, and then in the second study, um, those who also had parent training and risperidone. So kind of parallel, uh, surprising in a way. Um, totally different populations in the two studies, and. Uh, similar ages, similar doses used, but again, uh, it comes back um, and certainly at least suggests maybe we could influence or bias social uh, behavior through a medication approach. The final example of that um, that I'm going to give you is um, in that same um, methylphenidate study of the treatment of ADHD behaviors with Connie Kazary, uh, we developed a little sub-study in that trial. About a third of the kids from five to nine years of age uh, were videotaped um, at, at each study visit. And we looked at differences in their social behavior with some of those same kind of um, uh, uh, social communication behaviors that Dr. Goldsrud told you about, the joint attention, initiation, and um, uh, similar uh, measures. And we contrasted uh, the, the rate of those on placebo to the identified best dose and uh, the low dose condition. And these differences were significant. Again, the effect sizes uh, for you statistical aficionados was about um, in the range of 0.4 or so. Um, not bad, um, at least as a first pass. But it suggests that, um, again, there might be ways in which to kind of bias or so, um, modestly improve social, in this case, um, uh, joint, joint attention, a core deficit in initiations. And you might consider this in a way, interest in others. Um, and so we're, we're following up on these kinds of things um, in uh, some current studies. Um, first, uh, with, re with respect to um, anxiety, and social behavior. We're um, testing an experimental drug that's not uh, currently marketed that has um, a number of effects on the GABA system that we think may uh, lead it to reduce anxiety. And we're asking the question, if we selectively um, increase uh, GABA uh, signaling in the brain and possibly reduce anxiety, would that also be uh, manifest by some improvements in social behavior? And can we measure it with EEG? And can we even predict who might respond more um, to the treatment? In a second study, um, we're looking uh, again at um, uh, these neuropeptide systems uh, by blocking uh, the arginine vasopressin, uh, vasopressin receptor. And we're, we're, again, asking the question, we're really focusing in quite intensely on social behavior. Does that change uh, with this more targeted manipulation? And does it relate to changes in mood and irritability? And then thirdly, um, you know, we've all been uh, impressed and frustrated at times by just how slow the pace can be in these treatments and how long it takes, how many hours and years of intervention. 
is there some way that we could smartly accelerate that progress by enhancing some core um, uh, uh, feature that would increase the child's engagement in um, these types of behavioral treatments? Especially those, um, as you know, most of them are um, adult facilitated or they involve interaction with an individual. And so in um, one study, we're looking at kids who have very low uh, verbal ability and who haven't responded well to uh, prior intervention. And we're using um, actually this medication, aripiprazole, because we believe that it may uh, help bias um, uh, some of the brain reward systems to being uh, more responsive, more uh, reactive. And then we're comparing um, kids, all of whom get inten this intensive uh, language intervention developed by uh, the Casary Lab, and seeing if those kids on medication have an acceleration of improvement versus those on placebo over just a 12-week period. So if we change reward somewhat, as we believe we might be able to do, can we um, speed things up even a little bit? And can we predict who responds? So, you know, we've already told that NIMH director, these cures aren't gonna come easily, so please be patient. Um, but at the same time, he's got us thinking about uh, how to aim our sights higher. And um, uh, fortunately, you know, we have made progress. We've identified some treatments that really do work reliably and seem to have very good safety for the most part. And we're, we're working more to even improve beyond that. Um, but our focus now is shifting significantly in 2014 to looking at those core behaviors, thinking about what might be effective in, in, in altering those, and then um, how can we make the most out of these really uh, powerful behavioral treatments to accelerate progress and bring kids um, back uh, on pace. So thanks for your attention and look forward to your questions. Maybe the oxytocin researchers were off base by focusing on repetitive behaviors. Um, they were following up on their earlier study, but in part that was by uh, default, so to speak, because when they actually looked for really, really good um, social uh, measures that you could uh, re-administer at multiple points over a six-week trial, uh, they came up with a pretty much a big zero. Um, and it, it's still somewhat of a challenge in our field um, to figure out the kinds of measurement tools that we could apply in, in a, a usual um, medication study format with multiple administrations and um, the sensitivity to change within a relatively short period of time. But I, I agree, uh, one would really want to focus on social um, behavior change with the oxytocin. There's a lot of concern um, also, as you said, about uh, whether we can even administer it in ways that get into the brain. Uh, because when people have tried to give more, thinking that we're probably at a minimal um, effective dose, they quickly find that the intranasal delivery, it, it's just impossible, that starts running down the throat and this and that. So um, many, many practical challenges as well as uh, conceptual and experimental ones.